Hello, my friends, this is Dr. Beter. Today is June 30, 1982, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 76. On the afternoon of June 25, just five days ago, reporters were summoned to the White House press room for a sudden major announcement. At around 3 p.m., the entity known as President Reagan strode in and walked to the microphone. Then with an announcement about a minute long, he dropped what seemed to be a bombshell. For public consumption he began the announcement with words of praise and regret, but his face was the face of an executioner. Then he came to the only words that really mattered. With great regret I have accepted the resignation of Secretary of State Al Haig. The impression was given that Haig had resigned voluntarily and that its timing was a great surprise. But that impression was not the truth, my friends. Reagan's very next words were, I am nominating as his successor and he has accepted uh, George Schultz. Uh, to replace him. Haig's ouster had been planned very carefully by insiders close to Reagan. After stunning reporters with the announcement about Haig, the President refused to give any reasons and left without taking questions. A little later it was announced that Haig himself would make a statement at the State Department. It was scheduled for 4 p.m., but Haig was nearly half an hour late. He had learned of his ouster only a few hours earlier around noon. He had been compelled to compose a letter of resignation and pretend for public consumption that he had already given it to Reagan, but his late arrival at the State Department press conference was due to the fact that he was putting last-minute touches on his public statement. When Haig arrived at the State Department Auditorium, he faced an audience of around 1,000 reporters and Department employees. As he was greeted by thunderous applause, Haig looked around wide-eyed as if in a daze. He had been ordered to keep his entire statement to a maximum of five minutes. He had also been warned not to accept questions. We have been told by the controlled major media that Haig resigned as an abrasive prima donna and sensed that he was not getting his way. But when Haig took the microphone that afternoon at the State Department, his demeanor was far from that of a prima donna. He was instead a defeated general at the moment of surrender. The peculiar etiquette that governs this type of situation caused his words to obscure this fact, but his voice and mannerisms were laden with the unmistakable burden of defeat. He spoke slowly, trying to keep the quaver in his voice under control. His tones were the lifeless tones of resignation that say, I tried, but I failed. Haig read the text of his alleged resignation letter to Reagan, which he had written hurriedly that afternoon. He began by praising the alleged original foreign policy plans of the Reagan Administration before it was subverted by the Bolsheviks here. At one point he could hardly get the words out. I believe that uh, we shared a view of America's role in the world as the, as the leader of free men and an inspiration for all. Then he went on to describe a change of course which has taken place. In recent months it has become clear to me that the foreign policy on which we embarked together was shifting from that careful course which we laid out. Under these circumstances, I feel it necessary to request that you accept my resignation. My friends, diplomatic language is often so bland that it tends to make momentous statements sound tame and mild to the public. In recent months American foreign policy has indeed been moving away from what could be called a careful course, just as Haig said. As I have been reporting, we are on a fast new timetable for a nuclear war. 
Haig was the top Government operative of the faction which has been trying to prevent the coming war, but, my friends, the anti-war faction has lost, and Haig's ouster is the most visible signal that this has happened. In the aftermath of the Haig bombshell, people have been falling all over themselves trying to explain it, but the more they talk, the farther away from the truth they get. The closest anyone in the major media has come to the truth was a statement just 10 minutes after Haig's appearance at the State Department. At about 4.40 p.m. Eastern Time, June 25, Sam Donaldson of ABC Television News said, and I quote, It may seem strange for people who know General Haig's background, but the hardliners from the standpoint of the Soviet-American relations and the hardliners when it comes to trying to curb what many people see as excessive violence by Israel in Lebanon have won on this one." Unquote. My friends, Sam Donaldson was right about the hardliners having defeated Haig, but there is far more to it than that. The so-called resignation of Alexander Haig on June 25 was a disaster for the anti-nuclear war forces here. It is tied to other events, the end of the Falklands War, the beginning of the Mideast War, and others. And the timing of Haig's demise, which seems to mystify the major media, was dictated by a very specific event. That event, my friends, was the launch of Space Shuttle Mission No. 4, now in progress. My three special topics for this AUDIO LETTER are Topic No. 1 the collapse of the Hague anti-war coup d'etat. Topic No. 2, the final crises to ignite nuclear war. And Topic No. 3, the final Space Shuttle mission for war. Topic No. 1. There is a sad lesson of history that has been repeated more times than can be counted, from ancient times right down to the present day. The lesson is that by and large people are incapable of being warned about major calamities to come. It is human nature to think that the future will not be much different from the past. If something has not happened before, we find it hard to believe it can happen at all. And this has never been more true than when an impending calamity is the result of spiritual decay and moral degeneration. Today. We are living under the threat of just such a calamity, all-out thermonuclear war. The threat exists for reasons which are fundamentally moral and spiritual in nature, and if the calamity comes, it will have consequences which are impossible to grasp in advance. As a result, for most of us the threat of nuclear war is one which we only half believe. We worry when we hear about new crises and we squirm at the thought of ever-increasing nuclear arsenals. But in the last analysis, most of us go right on living our lives as if these things did not exist. Deep down we tell ourselves, surely it can't really happen. We tend to think that our situation today is without parallel in human existence, but that is not true. We are told that in ancient times a man named Noah was warned in advance about an equally incomprehensible calamity. He lived in a generation of people who were filling the land with abominations in total disregard for the Creator and His laws. Noah was warned that a giant killer flood was coming as a direct result of these spiritual and moral transgressions. Noah began building an ark, and he also began warning all his neighbors as he had been directed by the Lord. The building of the ark consumed not just years, but decades. All the while Noah continued to warn the people of his land about what was to come. But the people were incapable of being warned. They found the idea of a great flood incomprehensible and unbelievable because it had never happened before. And besides, they were too busy living their own lives, doing as they pleased. So they laughed at Noah and his never-ending warnings until the day it began to rain. On that day they suddenly knew that the warnings had been true, but it was too late and they perished. My friends, 
the forced resignation of Alexander Haig five days ago may well be the first raindrop of the nuclear storm to come. If so, the time has come and gone for preventing nuclear calamity. Unless something very dramatic takes place to radically change the situation, it is now only a matter of time, and not much time at that. As of now, the Bolshevik war planners in the Pentagon are still on track with their plan to set off nuclear war by the middle of September 1982. This is true even though the intended final phase of their war plan has been crippled, as I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 74 two months ago, and as of this moment I have no information to indicate that they will be stopped. I realize, my friends, that your decisions about what to do would be far easier if I could flatly tell you exactly what to expect and when. I cannot do that because this is a power struggle on the world stage, and the outcome is yet to be decided. The best I can do is to keep you informed about the forces involved and how they are doing against one another. As of this hour, and the hour is very late, the efforts to prevent NUCLEAR WAR ONE appear to be failing. I know that what I am reporting to you is very grave indeed. If you are to derive any benefit from what I have to report, you must have the assurance that my intelligence about these matters is reliable. Sometimes people ask me for documentation of my reports, but in intelligence documentation of that type is inherently impossible. Instead, a different criterion is normally used for judging the accuracy and reliability of intelligence data. That criterion, my friends, is the extent to which advanced intelligence reports are borne out by events. For that reason, in this AUDIO LETTER I will use direct quotes from a number of my past AUDIO LETTER reports over the past year or so. For those of you who have been listeners for some time, this will serve as a reminder of what you already know but may have forgotten. For my newer listeners, I hope this will help to establish the reality of the situation very quickly, because, my friends, time is precious. For some three years now the United States Government has been torn by a bitter power struggle between two opposing factions. One faction consists of agents of the Rockefeller Cartel, of Big Oil, Big Business, and Big Banking. Until recently the Government was dominated by the Cartel. The other faction is that of the American Bolsheviks, together with expelled Bolsheviks from Russia who have flocked here for a new start. For historical reasons, these two power factions, the Rockefeller Group and the Bolsheviks, had always worked together until very recently. The Rockefeller Empire started its climb to power over a century ago with the aid of the Rothschilds, based in England and Europe. Likewise. Bolshevism as a political force was created by the Rothschilds around the turn of the century. When the time was ripe for revolution in Russia, Rothschild spawned Bolshevism was injected into Russia with Rockefeller help. From then on a secret alliance existed between the Rockefeller interests and the Bolsheviks on a worldwide basis, but in the past few years all that has changed. A new anti-Bolshevik ruling group has taken over in Russia and has expelled most of the old Bolsheviks there. They have come mainly here to the United States in great swarms in recent years. They were welcomed here with open arms by their old Rockefeller allies. They reinforced the longtime American Bolsheviks who were already here. Then early in 1979 the Bolsheviks double-crossed their Rockefeller partners and launched an all-out grab for power. The Bolshevik grab for power over the United States Government began with the murder of Nelson Rockefeller on January 26, 1979. This was followed by months of infighting behind the scenes, including assassinations, resignations, and disappearances of key people. But true to Bolshevik tradition, it was all carried out in the shadows, hidden from the public eye. Then the turmoil escalated still further 
as the intelligence agencies of foreign nations entered the fray. By the spring of 1979 a full-scale intelligence war was raging here in America, especially in Washington. In addition to agents of the Rockefeller Cartel and the Bolsheviks, the intelligence agencies of Russia, Britain, and Israel were involved. All were trying to maneuver the crisis for their own benefit, and all were using their most advanced and most secret intelligence techniques, including some that would seem at home in the 21st century. These events all took place behind closed doors, hidden from the public eye by winners and losers alike in each skirmish. In battles at the pinnacle of power, that is how it is. There is never an appeal to the public to the police or to the courts, for it is they who control the courts, the police, and our other institutions. At the pinnacle of power there is no appeal to higher authority, because in their view there is none. So disputes are settled by the oldest means known to man, namely by finding out who has the biggest stick. This is why power struggles take place in governments, and that is why wars take place between nations. It is all a struggle for raw power in an arena where no holes are barred. 1979 was a year of strange events when the so-called Carter Administration appeared to go crazy on several occasions. At one point the entire Carter Cabinet was fired in mass. It sent shockwaves around the world until a reconstituted Cabinet was formed. At another point the entity Carter disappeared to Camp David for weeks on end. Meanwhile, worried rumors swirled like a storm through Washington circles. All of these events were the direct result of the hidden turmoil which I had made public in my reports months earlier, but for public consumption these and other shocks came and went without the truth ever being told officially. By late 1979 the dust was beginning to settle. The Rockefeller Cartel had been grievously wounded, but it was not destroyed or totally unseated from government influence. The Bolsheviks here had acquired a dominant position over the United States Government, but their power was complete only in the military area. For reasons I have detailed in many past reports, the Bolsheviks here were and are bent on throwing the United States into nuclear war against Russia. To the Bolsheviks, aliens in our midst. Our entire country is nothing but a giant tool to further their own dreams of world power. Up until the hidden Bolshevik coup d'etat here three years ago, the Rockefeller Cartel too was bent on nuclear war, but now having lost control of the United States military, they can no longer afford nuclear war, so now they've changed their tune. On all sides Rockefeller spokesmen are speaking out against the threat of nuclear war. The Rockefeller public relations machine is the most sophisticated in the world. Almost overnight it has stirred up public fears into a strong anti-nuclear movement. Within the government itself, Rockefeller Cartel agents have been slowly regaining some of their lost power. As they do so they are trying to chip away at the Bolshevik plans for nuclear war which is now imminent. The most important of all Rockefeller Cartel operatives in the government, my friends, was Secretary of State Alexander Haig. Haig owed his presence in the Administration to the fact that the so-called Reagan Administration was initially installed by the Rockefeller Cartel, but the Bolsheviks here were determined not to let the Rockefeller Group consolidate their gains. On November 30, 1980, just a few weeks after the rigged Reagan landslide, I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 60, quote, But the Bolsheviks here are working fast. They are in a hurry to seize control of the so-called Reagan team themselves. And further on, quote, Some day sooner than you think, we Americans may be in for a shock. We will be told that the entity President Reagan has met with an unfortunate accident or a sudden fatal illness, unquote. Four months later, on March 30, 1981, there was a Presidential assassination attempt at the Washington Hilton Hotel. For public consumption all stories quickly converge on the traditional lone assassin theory, and just to make that more believable, a psychologically programmed scapegoat was on hand, 
firing random shots. John Hinckley, Jr. There was ample evidence that Hinckley was not alone and could not have fired the shot that hit the President, as I detailed in AUDIO LETTER No. 63. But never mind, seeing is believing even when it is a lie. Hinckley was conveniently wrestled to the sidewalk, gun in hand, right next to television cameras. Just eight days ago a Washington jury shocked the world by finding Hinckley not guilty by reason of insanity. As it turned out, the shooting did not cause a change of face in the Oval Office. Even so, it did achieve what the Bolsheviks here wanted. It created a period of vulnerability which halted the momentum of the new Rockefeller Cartel governmental programs. Within a matter of weeks, the Bolsheviks here were once again in the driver's seat, especially at the Pentagon. Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger had come into office with the new Administration, but he was a Bolshevik mole in the Rockefeller machine. Ever since the Reagan assassination attempt, Weinberger and Haig have been at each other's throats because they are on opposite sides of the power struggle. Over the past year or so there have been more and more stories about Haig feuding with other members of the Administration. This was because Haig was the point man in the continuing Rockefeller Cartel struggle to unseat the Bolsheviks here. That situation started coming to a head early this year of 1982. When I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 72 four months ago on February 28, 1982, I reported on major new developments in the plans of both factions. First I reported that a drastic speed-up was taking place in the American Bolshevik nuclear war plans. I stated that, quote, a drastic change is now taking place in the secret war planning here in America. The timetable for Nuclear War I has now been speeded up by many months. My friends, as of now the new target date for an American nuclear surprise attack on Russia is mid-September 1982." Unquote. I also revealed the reason for the speed-up in war plans. It was the result of a major intelligence coup against Russia by the American Bolsheviks. Thanks to this intelligence breakthrough, the Bolshevik war planners here now have critical data which was formerly lacking to enable an attack on Russia. In that same AUDIO LETTER REPORT No. 72 I also revealed the Rockefeller Cartel response to this new turn of events. It was to be a military coup d'etat by military officers loyal to the Rockefeller Group. Here is what I reported four months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 72, and once again I quote, The Rockefeller Cartel cannot afford to let their Bolshevik enemies here succeed in setting off nuclear war. Therefore the military coup d'etat must take place before the American Bolshevik surprise attack against Russia. If possible, the coup will be carried out before the fourth Space Shuttle flight this summer because war will be possible any time after that." Unquote. I also reported that, quoting again, the General in charge of the coup to come, my friends, is General Alexander Haig, presently Secretary of State. He is looking forward to the day when he can really say, I am in charge here." End quote from AUDIO LETTER No. 72. In these days of managed news, major events often take place with little or no notice to the public about what is going on. Even so, when those events are big enough, they usually create a visible ripple on the surface that can be seen in public. In my report four months ago, I tried my best to prepare you to read the ripples produced by the struggle over a coup d'etat. Here is what I reported then, quote, If the military takeover does take place, it too is likely to be largely hidden in its details from public view. Only one event in the plan is likely to be visible to all. That event, my friends, will be the sudden death of the entity known as President Ronald Reagan. If that happens by the end of summer 1982, no matter what the official story may be, you will know that the military coup d'etat has taken place. On the other hand, should something happen to Secretary of State Haig by that time, it could well mean that the Bolsheviks have foiled the coup. It is all a race against time, my friends, and the stakes in this race involve nothing less than the very survival of our United States. 
End of quotation. In my reports since then, I have updated the progress of these intrigues by both the Rockefeller Cartel and the Bolsheviks here. In AUDIO LETTER No. 73 I revealed the overall war strategy which the Bolshevik war planners here were developing under the code name Project Z. It is a three-phase plan for a protracted nuclear war following the American first strike against Russia. In recent days, public hints about this new Pentagon strategy for a protracted war have started leaking publicly. Our Bolshevik Defense Secretary Caspar Weinberger was even questioned on television about the new protracted war plan ten days ago. Weinberger was interviewed on the Sunday morning ABC News program This Week with David Brinkley. Naturally, Weinberger denied it all, but, my friends, he lied. Meanwhile, the Rockefeller Cartel has been working feverishly to try to stave off the nuclear war that will cost them everything. To this end, a limited quid pro quo for anti-war purposes has been forged lately between the Cartel and Russia's new anti-Bolshevik rulers. The key Rockefeller operative in this move has been Alexander Haig. He was engaged in three major bargaining sessions with Russian Foreign Minister Gromyko in nine months. The last of these was a two-day marathon in New York City just days before Haig's ouster. Haig's removal has caused secret agreements between Haig and Gromyko to be shot out of mid-air. One major product of the recent Rockefeller-Soviet relationship was the secret destruction of key Bolshevik-controlled military forces in late April. These were based in the Southern Hemisphere, which is expected to escape major damage in Nuclear War One. The operation led to the Falklands War as its aftermath as I detailed in AUDIO LETTER No. 74. The joint Rockefeller-Soviet operation, which was highly successful, badly crippled the ability of the Bolsheviks to carry out Phase Three of their new war plan. It was expected that this would slow down the Bolshevik timetable for Nuclear War One, but, my friends, it hasn't happened. If the Bolsheviks cannot have total victory, then they will settle for a smoldering stalemate. They still expect to survive while their enemies, the Russians and the Rockefeller Cartel, are reduced to ashes. While the Bolsheviks here and in Britain had their hands full with the Falklands War, the military coup d'etat here was also gaining ground. Just last month I reported on major gains by the Rockefeller Group in retaking control of the CIA from the Bolsheviks, but early this month, June 1982, it all began to unravel. With the approach of Space Shuttle Mission No. 4, the deadline for the Haig-led coup d'etat was near. Security around the entity Reagan was doubled and redoubled. When he went to the UN to speak on June 17, the New York Daily News described the, quote, extraordinary precautions that were in force. His limousine even jumped the sidewalk, driving up right next to the door. All this was happening as key Hague operatives in the intended coup d'etat were being eliminated. Out of public view, nothing less than a new Bolshevik purge has swept through the United States Government. It was completed just in time from the Bolshevik viewpoint. On Friday, June 25, Hague was confronted with the reality of defeat. His anti-war coup d'etat had collapsed just two days before the launch of Space Shuttle 4. Topic No. 2. This month of June 1982 has seen the apparent end of one war and the beginning of another. The war between Britain and Argentina for the Falkland Islands ended, at least for now, on June 14. That day the Argentine garrison at Port Stanley surrendered to the British. Meanwhile a new war was already underway in the Middle East. Israel had launched its long-planned all-out invasion of Lebanon. The Falkland Islands War had come as a surprise to the master planners of nuclear war to come, the Bolsheviks here. The Falklands fighting and the secret hostilities which preceded it were intended to upset those nuclear war plans, as I detailed in AUDIO LETTER No. 74, and so the Bolsheviks, who were fomenting violence worldwide, 
stamped out the unwanted Falklands War as fast as they could. The Thatcher Government in Britain, which is Bolshevik controlled, is now left with a legacy of grievous losses which are being covered up. A major key to the Thatcher cover-up of the true extent of British losses is the continued posture of belligerence toward Argentina. It is being said that a sizable British military presence will be maintained in the South Atlantic. This provides a tailor-made excuse for the fact that many British ships, sailors, and soldiers will not be coming home any time soon. The fact that some of them will never return home can be hidden and the families affected inform piecemeal a few at a time. In this way the Thatcher Government intends to keep the lid on the situation. Another ingredient in the Thatcher cover-up plan is the at-sea repair ship Stena Inspector. It was bought from American interests in May and is now being refitted at the Savannah Shipyard Company in Georgia. Soon it will head for the South Atlantic to begin patching up many British vessels which were damaged in the Falklands War. When and if they return to Britain, the true extent of the damage done to the Royal Navy will have been literally covered up. The final outcome of the Falklands War was a setback for the Rockefeller Cartel and their limited partners, the new rulers of Russia. The Rockefeller Soviet team won Round 1 of the South Atlantic Fray, which was a covert warfare during April. I gave the details in AUDIO LETTER No. 74, but Round 2, the battle for the Falklands themselves, turned out differently. Despite the damage done to the Royal Navy, it was the Rockefeller Cartel and the Russians who were outmaneuvered in the Falklands battle. It was known that the objective of the joint Rockefeller-Russian action in the Southern Hemisphere was to upset Bolshevik nuclear war plans, so the Bolsheviks responded by deliberately overreacting militarily. Virtually the entire Royal Navy was dispatched to the South Atlantic. A situation was created in which a British recapture of the Falklands could not be stopped without setting off nuclear war itself. Finally, a totally unorthodox landing tactic was used to get British troops ashore, as I detailed last month. The end result was that the Rockefeller Russian pledge to the Argentine Junta was impossible to fulfill, at least for now. The Bolsheviks are hoping that the resulting turmoil now taking place in the Argentine Government will halt Argentina's rapid move toward Russia. In the past Argentina was always staunchly anti-Soviet, but under Russia's new rulers a major and growing trade relationship has been building between Russia and Argentina. The majority of Argentina's huge exports of meat and grain now go to Russia, and last month relations between Argentina and Cuba suddenly started warming up. The Bolsheviks here would like to reverse all this and ultimately deny Argentina's food to Russia. Whether that will happen remains to be seen. If Nuclear War I does not erupt first, there are likely to be many surprises down the road in Argentina and Latin America. But as I say these words, the final war sequence planned by the Bolsheviks is already getting underway. This is the sequence of brush fire wars and regional crises which are intended to lead directly into Nuclear War I. This intended final sequence of crises began this month on June 5. On that day Israeli tanks began moving across the border into a so-called Christian enclave in southern Lebanon. The following day the world learned that Israel was launching an all-out invasion of Lebanon. More than a year ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 63 I made public the joint strategy of the Bolsheviks and Zionists to pave the way for nuclear war. It was a complex five-track plan patterned after the build-up to World War I with its proliferation of pre-war crises. I now quote from AUDIO LETTER No. 63, All five tracks in the Bolshevik war path converge about mid-1982. By then they expect to have America on a war footing. All four Space Shuttle missions are planned to be completed by then. The offensive weapons now in the works will be ready, and by then the world will be a cauldron of crises made to order for setting off nuclear war suddenly and without warning. 
Just as crises in the Balkans triggered World War I, a world in crisis will trigger Nuclear War I." End quote from AUDIO LETTER No. 63. Mid-1982 has now arrived, my friends, and the Bolshevik maneuvering to drag the world into war is right on schedule. This month on June 13, the Washington Post published a major article titled, A World Suddenly Assaulted by Gunfire. It begins, quote, by State Department count, three major and eight lesser wars were going on last week in a world that seemed suddenly beset by blazing battles." Unquote. Yes, my friends, it is sudden, but it is not accidental. The Bolsheviks here are responsible for the fires that are burning worldwide. Their plans, laid out more than a year ago, are now reaching fruition. As I've detailed in the past, the Bolsheviks, now headquartered here in America, are allied closely with the militant Zionists in Israel. This situation is as much a mystery to the people of Israel as it is to the people of America. In both countries the average citizen is getting worried. In Israel, as in America, the present government is bent on deliberately raising the level of tension, violence, and nuclear war danger. In both countries more and more people are becoming alarmed over the growing danger without realizing that it is all deliberate. The government which now rules Israel came to power in a sudden astonishing change in April 1977. The previous Prime Minister, Rabin, resigned abruptly. As always in these situations, a suitable excuse was found for public consumption. In Rabin's case, a mini-scandal over insignificant financial matters was fabricated to explain away his departure, but the real reason was what I reported that month in AUDIO LETTER No. 23. Rabin had learned of secret plans for a major Middle East war and wanted no part of it. Rabin was replaced by a man of very different attitudes. The new Prime Minister was a man who frightened many that had been thought incapable of seizing control of the Israeli Government. He was known as an extremist, tracing all the way back to his days as the most wanted of all Israeli terrorists by the British. The idea that he might actually rule Israel some day had been unthinkable to many. Suddenly the new ruler of Israel was a man named Menachem Begin. Begin is representative of the most extreme faction of the political movement known as Zionism. The Zionists use religious-sounding terminology and biblical words to disguise the true nature of their goals, which are satanic. Political Zionism is as different from classical Judaism as night is from day. Like all the world's great religions, classical Judaism is based on worship of the Almighty, and it does so from its own distinct perspective. Judaism emphasizes the justice of God. Islam his righteousness and power, Christianity his love, Hinduism his spiritual essence, Buddhism the peace that comes only from God. Justice is the hallmark of true Judaism, but it has nothing at all to do with political Zionism except as a deceptive slogan. The Jews who have been lured to the land called Israel have gone there by and large believing the promises of a better life. But what they have gotten instead is a government which per capita has become the most violent and warlike on earth. There is no peace, saith the Lord, for the wicked, and the Begin government in Israel is as wicked as the Reagan government here. Modern Israel is no longer a threatened underdog, as it constantly pretends. Instead, Israel has become the world's third most powerful nation militarily after Russia and the United States. Using its runaway military might, the Zionist Government of Israel is setting the world on fire. It is doing so with the blessing and support of their American Bolshevik allies. The agony which is being inflicted on tiny Lebanon, which has never done Israel harm, is beyond description, my friends. Over 10,000 Lebanese civilians have been slaughtered by the Israelis and over 600,000 made homeless. Even the sanitized reports on American television cannot entirely hide the wanton savagery of the Israeli invasion. 
One report after another shows devastation of entire city blocks on a scale not seen since World War II. On all sides the reports describe Israeli shelling and dive bombing of Beirut, Sidon, and other Lebanese cities with one word, indiscriminate. My friends, Classical Judaism regards man as a crown and glory of God's creation. Man is supposed to have been formed in God's own image. Would God, the just God of Judaism, have done what Israel has done in Lebanon? Are arrogance, bestiality, and genocide in the image of God? Or are they in the image of Satan instead? What the Israelis are doing now in Lebanon is claimed to be in retaliation for provocations by the Palestine Liberation Organization, but the fact is that the present events are part of the long-range plan to bring on nuclear war. In AUDIO LETTER No. 70 last December 1981 I reported that, quote, the joint war plan of the American Bolsheviks and the Zionists in Israel is still on track. They are shooting for a Middle East war to break out before the end of summer 1982." End quote. It is now the summer of 1982, and the desired Middle East war is raging. In AUDIO LETTER No. 68 I reported that the Begin plan was to goad the PLO into violence. Time after time over the past year or so the Israeli Air Force has mounted devastating air raids on Lebanon, creating widespread devastation and death. The purpose of these repeated Israeli violations of the ceasefire was to provoke a highly visible counterattack by the PLO. With that as a pretext, the Begin Government intended to justify its planned invasion of Lebanon. But the PLO never did respond in kind to the Israeli goading. Aside from occasional small raids and shelling incidents, nothing was done that was sufficiently dramatic for the intended purpose. Meanwhile, time was running out. The fast new war timetable required the Middle East War to get underway without further delay. So on June 3 the Begin Government provided its own pretext for war. That day the Israeli Ambassador to Great Britain was gunned down by an assassin hired by Israel's own intelligence agency, the Mossad. The Begin Government immediately professed to be outraged saying this was the last straw. Two days later the Israeli forces, which had already been massed along the Lebanese border, invaded. The unbridled savagery of the Israeli attack has shocked the world. In effect, the nation that calls itself Israel has turned the Palestinians into the new Jews of the world. They have no home. They are dispersed. They, along with the innocent victims of their host country, Lebanon, are the victims of genocide, a military holocaust without justice or mercy. Protests and condemnation of the Israeli behavior in Lebanon are mounting worldwide. Nowhere is the worry greater than within the Jewish community itself. In Israel, popular sentiment against the Begin Government is erupted into widespread demonstrations, and elsewhere around the world many Jews are also speaking out against the Israeli-inflicted holocaust. But through it all, my friends, the Reagan-Begin axis of the American Bolsheviks and the militant Israeli Zionists continues to function smoothly. In his United Nations speech of June 17, the entity President Reagan condemned armed aggression, quote unquote, and to the new Russian pledge not to be the first to use nuclear weapons in war, Reagan demanded, quote, deeds, not words. But when it comes to Israel, those criteria are never applied. The Begin Government agrees in words to one ceasefire after another, but in deeds it breaks each truce when ready. And Israeli armed aggression has left nearly 20 percent of the population of Lebanon homeless. The whole world is shocked and outraged, yet all this has not provoked even a slap on the wrist for Israel from Washington. My friends, the Satanic Begin Government is now in its sixth year in Israel. This month, June, is the sixth month of the year. On the fifth day of the month the Israeli invasion of Lebanon began, and with it abominations of military desolation. It all brings to mind the visions of the Prophet Ezekiel, Chapter 8. The Prophet says in the first verse, 
that he was shown visions in the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day of that month. He was shown abominations spawned in the Holy Land by people who arrogantly said, The Lord does not see us. The chapter ends in the words, Then he said to me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger, and lo, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. Topic No. 3 Earlier this month on June 18 there was a fascinating announcement from NASA. Two American spacecraft, the most distant man-made objects in the universe, may be on the verge of a major new discovery. These two space probes have been racing through space for ten years and nine years respectively. After all that time they are now nearing the edge of our solar system, whose vastness is almost beyond comprehension, and as they do so they are preparing to observe a giant mystery object in the skies. The mystery object, whatever it is, is thought to lie billions of miles beyond the outermost known planet Pluto. It is so far away that it has never been observed by astronomers here on Earth, yet many are sure that there is something out there. Something, whatever it is, keeps disturbing the criss-crossing orbits of little Pluto and giant Neptune. The effect even penetrates inward to the monster planet Uranus. So no one knows what it is or where it is. It may be a tenth planet. It may be a dark star farther away. It could even be that most chilling of all celestial objects, a black hole, with gravity so strong light itself cannot escape. No one has seen it, so no one knows. But now, after a decade of space travel, two American deep space probes may be on the verge of giving us the answers. The probes are Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11, launched in 1972 and 73 respectively. They are nuclear-powered spacecraft designed to escape from our solar system and coast forever through the void of interstellar space. When they cross the outer boundary of our solar system around 1990, they are expected to be sending back data about what they find. It should be mankind's first taste of interstellar space, that is, if anyone is still listening by then. Two months ago on April 12, 1982, Aviation Week in Space Technology magazine devoted its editorial space to a statement by Dr. James A. Van Allen. Dr. Van Allen is the space scientist who discovered the radiation belts around the Earth that now bear his name 24 years ago. His article is titled, Pioneer's Unfunded Reach for the Stars. He listed an astonishing list of major new discoveries made by the Pioneer probes during the past decade and he issued an appeal for the program to be saved from imminent destruction. Dr. Van Allen's article begins with the sad words, quote, One of the most incredible features of the fiscal 1983 program of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration is a premature termination of the deep space missions of Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11. The annual saving is $3 million or four ten-thousandths of the agency's budget." Unquote. My friends, the so-called Reagan Administration decision to cancel the half-completed Pioneer program is incredible, but it's in character with this Administration's entire approach to space and science in general. Anything that will help the Bolsheviks here prepare to wage war is funded, no matter how much it costs but everything that merely adds to the peaceful, constructive knowledge of mankind is being guillotined no matter how little it costs. For the past year and a half I have been reporting periodically about this developing situation. America's space program has been systematically whittled away to leave almost nothing but the Space Shuttle. The Space Shuttle has been spared only because of its critical importance for military purposes. Over the past year or so, military control of the Shuttle program has become more and more blatant. 
The Bolshevik war planners who now control the United States military will brook no interference with their nuclear war plans. The overt military takeover of the Shuttle program began just over a year ago in May 1981 following the hidden disaster of the first Shuttle flight. The civilian director of the Shuttle program, John Yardley, was eased out. Several months later, in October 1981, he was officially replaced by an Air Force General, James Abramson. Since that time, the Bolshevik warlords have been expanding and consolidating their control over the Shuttle and NASA itself. Reorganization has become the order of the day at NASA, with military control becoming more absolute with each change. In its original concept, the Space Shuttle was to be a stepping stone into space for both civilian and military purposes. It was to be a system that would continue to grow and be improved over the years by continued development, but that idea has now gone out the window thanks to the total takeover of the Shuttle program by Bolshevik military managers. To them, even the Shuttle is only a short-term stepping stone to war. They intend to set off NUCLEAR WAR-1 before any further development of the Shuttle could bear fruit, and so, under Bolshevik military control, NASA is now turning its back on the traditional mission of advancing the technology of space flight. The entire NASA emphasis is shifting towards using the Space Shuttle as is for the short time left before war. The most stunning result of this radical policy change within NASA was announced about two months ago in April. It involves a man whose name is practically a synonym for America's manned space program. This man has played key roles in the planning and engineering of every single American manned space program. He was a member of the original Project Mercury team. He was deeply involved in the follow-on Project Gemini and a central figure in the Project Apollo Moon program. He directed the design and implementation of the Mission Control Center in Houston, and for the past ten years he has been Director of the Johnson Space Center. If you have followed America's manned space program closely over the years, you probably know his name as well as I do. I am talking about Dr. Christopher Kraft. The Bolshevik warlords here have decreed that NASA's days of technological development are now at an end. So one day last April Dr. Christopher Kraft was told that his services are no longer needed, and he was fired. As I say these words, my friends, Space Shuttle Mission No. 4 is underway. This is the last of the four initial crash military missions to prepare for a NUCLEAR WAR ONE. Each of these first four missions has involved two shuttles, not just one, as I first reported in AUDIO LETTERS 62 and 63. Each time the shuttle we see blasting off from Florida follows a path into space that is different from the one publicly claimed. As a result, it cannot return to Earth at the time and place it is supposed to. Therefore the two-man crew of each flight returns to Earth in a small Gemini-like space capsule. Then they board a different shuttle and rocket into view from a distance to land at the advertised time and place. I've given all the details in the past, so I'll not repeat them now. In the first three Space Shuttle launches, the launch took place into the northeast. Each time this was the beginning of a long, curving launch into the north to a near-polar orbit to pass over Russia, but this time the Shuttle took off in a different direction. It took off due east from Cape Canaveral into something called a minimum inclination orbit. This time it was heading not for the North Pole but toward the equator. The reason for this has to do with the secret Pentagon payload. It is a special sensor system designed to give confirmation of the first phase of the planned American nuclear first strike on Russia. As I reported last month, quote, in order to do its job, the Air Force infrared sensor has to be placed in geostationary orbit. That orbit is over 22,000 miles high over the equator." Unquote. In television coverage of the launch three days ago, the new flight path was mentioned briefly but not explained. For example, the transatlantic abort site this time was Dakar, Senegal, close to the equator. This is a change from the first three flights in which the transatlantic abort site was Rota, Spain, much farther north. The shuttle itself cannot go high enough to put the Air Force sensor into its final orbit. 
Instead, the sensor is perched atop a rocket carried in the cargo bay. For engineering reasons, the rocket had to be loaded into the shuttle while it was standing vertically, not parked horizontally. That's why for the first time the shuttle was loaded for this flight after it was ready on the launch pad. NASA spokesmen admitted publicly that this was done, but as always they never tell you the reason. Last month I reported that an on-schedule launch of Space Shuttle 4 would indicate that the Pentagon nuclear war plans are still on schedule. Sunday morning, June 27, Space Shuttle 4 became the first shuttle ever to take off exactly on schedule. Not a moment's delay was permitted, even though a sudden violent hailstorm the previous day had ruined more than 400 critical heat tiles. So far this shuttle flight is apparently proceeding as planned. That means, my friends, that the September deadline for Nuclear War 1 is still in effect as of now. Now it's time for my last minute summary. In this AUDIO LETTER I've been forced to be the bearer of bad news. The anti-nuclear war coup d'etat planned by General Alexander Haig has collapsed. More surprises are possible, but the time is now very short. The intended final war sequence has now begun in the Middle East at the hands of Israel, and Space Shuttle Mission No. 4, the last one needed for nuclear war, is now in progress. My friends, the danger of nuclear war is now the greatest that it has ever been since the summer of 1976. I cannot tell you for sure whether war will or will not erupt by September, because these war plans are the plans of men, and they are not infallible. What I can tell you for certain is that these days ahead will be filled with danger. The Rockefeller Cartel has apparently failed in its game plan to stop the Bolsheviks here. That leaves the arena of conflict to the Bolsheviks here versus the rulers of Russia. Two more deadly enemies are impossible to imagine, my friends. The Bolsheviks here are racing to position themselves for an all-out attack against Russia. Preemptive actions by the Kremlin to prevent that attack are virtually guaranteed. The results may well shake the world. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you and may God bless each and every one of you.